I welcome you to my lecture today. Of course, uh, today we are starting uh, chapter nine, which we call regression diagnostics. Um, today I'll be guided uh, by this outline where I'm basically going to differentiate between residual and error. Then we're going to talk about the significance of art matrix in statistical analysis. Then from there, um, going to uh, actually walk everyone through further regression diagnostics or R codes. Uh, if you look at the title, okay, uh, today's uh, title um, actually called regression diagnostics. I think I will need to first tell you uh, what is the essence of regression um, diagnostics. You know, the regression models that we use have assumptions, okay? And I, I told you the other time, uh, assumption, you know, a, a model is as good as assumption putting into a model. Okay, a model is as good as assumptions of putting into a model. So what actually uh, make a model to be great is when assumption hold. Of course, I've giving you uh, these assumptions the other time, normality, constant variance, independence, and so on like that. But how are we actually going to know whether assumptions old or not, that we need to uh, subject uh, our model to diagnostic testing, which we call regression diagnostics, okay? now. And let me tell you this, when we're talking about regression diagnostics, when we're talking about like investigating assumptions, do you know that assumptions centered on error? Assumptions that we're talking about. Assumptions centered on error. Assumptions that we talk about revolve around errors. Okay, and that is the reason why uh, investigating assumptions, of course, we're always going to have something to do with the error. But let me tell you this: we need to for our first look at our model in terms of the mean function and the variance function before we can do that. Don't forget, we want to subject our model to diagnostic testing. What is the essence of that? We want to see whether we can validate our model. Okay. You know, validating our model, of course, that is why the regression diagnostic is very, very important. But let's for a first look at the mean function because we know that um, investigating assumption is more or less like analysis of residua. I'm going to say that again. Investigating assumptions is more or less like analysis of residual. We are analyzing error. Okay, and how, how do we get error in the first place? Then we need to look at our model. Now, when you when we have um, a model, a, when we have a regression model, y equal x beta plus the error in a matrix form, there's the assumptions of this model revolve around the error. Now, if I want to find the mean function, okay, the mean function is actually that mean function that you see on the board and the variance function, we are assuming that the if I take the expectation of both sides, okay, if I take the expectation of both sides, you know, having this means expected value of error equal to zero. That's an assumption. What of if this guy is not? Okay. And not only that, the variance, 
of the arrow, it has to be sigma squared. And because of that, we're actually going to say error follow normal with the mean of zero and the variance of that. So which means without assumptions that revolve around the error, we may not be able to have this equation 9.1. Any question on that before I move? Any question? So which means we're able to have equation 9.1 because of the fact that we've made as options that central on the error. Okay, let's talk a look at the art matrix now. You remember the other time we talk about art matrix. Now, when you take a look at equation 9.1, if I want to fit, of course, fitting means I'm actually going to have an estimated model, okay? Now, when I say estimated model, okay, the estimated model, the estimated model is actually having this, putting a cap on Y, putting a cap on this. In that situation, Y is gonna be a predicted response. I can't have a predicted response without having a model. Where is the predicted response coming from? The predicted response is actually coming from the model. Then why, why do we have a cap on this guy? Because it's an estimate, okay? Don't forget that guy, the video cap, is basically uh, this guy. I think you remember that? Okay, now when I plug in that guy, when I plug that in, the beta cap, when I plug in this guy, I'm actually going to have HY. The heart, the H, is anything that has to do with the X. Do you see that? The heart matrix depends on the explanatory variable. That's what we mean. So based on what you're trying to see now, okay, so based on what you see now, you're basically going to see You're gonna see that um, if I if I got this guy, right, and this guy is this guy, right, and I plug that in, I plug that in. You know, I'm actually gonna have this guy. Okay, so when I focus on this side, the one that has to do with X, then I'm actually gonna have H. We are H now is the heart matrix. So the art matrix actually depend on X. Okay. If the art matrix, you know, you can see now equation 9.3 is actually um, the art matrix. Now, what is the essence of the art matrix? I'm going to tell you now. Do you know that uh, the art matrix that I just uh, talked about, we enable us to transform our observed response to the predicted. <laughs> You're going to see now. I'm going to say that again. You know, when you look at your data, you got the actual observation, like actual response, right? Without art matrix, you may not be able to transform the actual response to the uh, predicted response. That's exactly what we mean. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you now. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, projection matrix. I think I also use this as P the other time, right? It is the same. Good job. Oh, look at that. Art matrix allow us to transform actual response to predicted that is why it is called a projection matrix good job that's why it's called projection you know projection is the same thing as making prediction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now let's take a look at the error you know in whatever we do you know our model can't give us exact reality i think you know that right 
there's always going to be error. Okay. Now the error is just going to be the difference between the, um, the actual response and the predicted response. Now let us now plug in y cap. That will be a x beta cap, right? And what is a beta cap? Of course, the beta cap is actually uh, that. When I plug that in, what am I getting now? I'm getting high minus h, right? Is there, uh, is there anyone who have a trouble time understanding how I derive equation 9.4? Is there anyone who have a trouble time understanding that? Go ahead. Very good. I'm going to show you now. You know, high is more or less like an identity matrix, right? Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you now. Okay, so um, let me come this side. Um, if you take uh, the E cap, right? Okay, so Y minus, right? Then this guy, then if I actually come here and plug in, right there is y here there is y here right okay so if i factorize okay you know uh a, 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 a factorizing now the, the the y here is after all this right then the y here is also after something it means there's something here in scalar we're going to call it one but in matrix you're going to call it identity so uh in that situation, so don't forget my age. Does that make sense to you now? Okay. Now, uh, if you look at what we have done here, equation equation nine point four is telling a story. What story? The story is this. Before I can have an estimate of the error, what is E cap? That's an estimate of the error, right? That we call residual, right? Before we can actually have that, then we need a combination of the actual value of the response and the identity minus the heart matrix. That's what it's telling us. Okay. You know, in statistical analysis, there have been a kind of debate between error and residual. Of course, when you talk about error, that is unexplained variation. But let me tell you, this part of the is unexplained. If we basically want to tell how valid is our model, we need to estimate that. Estimating the error now is the E curve that we call residual. Does that make sense? Okay, so, and that is what I actually said. Now, let's take a look at the error. Let's define error. Error will not have anything that has to do with a cap, not an estimate, not the normal error, which is basically going to be the actual response minus the mean. You see the mean? The mean response, expected value of y uh, given s. And what is that? That would be x beta, not x beta cap, because we're talking about error and not residual. Which means, what is our beta in equation 9.5? Our beta is a population regression coefficient. Population regression coefficient. But what about beta curve? The beta curve will be estimated regression coefficient. Estimated is different from, I mean, the beta curve is meant from beta. Does that make sense now? Okay. Now, we have an assumption. Okay, when we are estimating residual, given any values of X, that conditional expectation must be equal to zero. What is it meaning in real life? Let's look at the meaning in real life. If I'm looking at the relationship between the amount spent advertising on sales, if the expected value of error curve given S equal to zero, you know what that means? It means every 
other variable that could affect the volume of sales, their effects on average is zero. That's why we don't include them in our model. That's why we're only focusing on uh, amount spent advertising. The variance of ECAP givenness is going to be equal to that, which means it's going to be in terms of art matrix. But this is different from a constant variance. The constant variance is just going to be sigma square identity or sigma squared. Okay? So, which means the variance of the error without a cap is sigma squared. But the variance of error with a cap is sigma squared I minus I at matrix. Now, you will now see that a clear difference now between residual and error. Take a look at that. You know, we've been able to uh, we've, we, we've been able to arrive at this, right? Can you see? You know, we're here, we're, we're here right now, right? If I now want to substitute for Y, right? This Y here, the entire model with the error component, I'm basically going to have I minus H, X beta cap plus the error. Do you see that? Now, this is why now, when 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 you are when you are actually um, specifying your model, we're always going to specify both deterministic and the random part. Yeah, I think you know that, right? Okay. Now, when you try to expand here, okay, you basically going to see. If if I have I minus that and I have uh you know all that, okay, you can actually if you try to multiply out, okay, and because of the fact that I minus um, H by X, because here yeah, if you multiply out, you're gonna have I minus H times X. You're also going to have I minus H times that and that times that. But this guy, naturally, when you try to work it out, it will basically give you zero. If you want to try that, you know your H, right? This is your H, right? So if you, if you, if, if you, if you multiply out I times that, X, right? Minus what is H? H is this guy. X, S transpose that. Then multiply by x. Look at this. This cancel this. Then I have x minus x equal to zero. <laughs> Mass is easy, right? Take a look at that. Now, in the end, I'm actually going to have. So, what have I established now? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to show you what I just established now. Okay, I just established. I just established relationship between residual and an error, which is basically this guy now. Okay, I minus H E. Look at it, look at the relationship. What, what, what does that imply? This guy is not the same as that guy. Because of the fact that this equal to this times that. Any question? So which means. If I want to estimate this guy, right? Then I need I minus H. So which means art matrix actually play a role in estimating our residual, our error. Okay? Okay. Now, uh, we, we are talking about regression assumptions. We can also have what we call unusual observations, okay, which could be outlier or high leverage. I think I've explained that uh, in this class before. You know, when you have an extreme value in Y in the response, you have an outlier. And if, it's you, if you have that in X, you have a high uh, leverage that also needs to be investigated. But do you know that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the HII, Okay, 
which is uh, which is equal to that if you want to find the whether the high level points uh has a potential influence because outlier and high leverage point they are unusual they are unusual they are anomalous you know, that need to be corrected okay they could potentially change results they could be damaging of course uh, we have a way to investigate that of course so uh we have a way to detect uh, outliers yeah, the traditional method that was used. You know, when I say outlier, according to Ben Camp in 1982, uh, outlier is uh, a data point that is not consistent with the rest. Okay? So uh, people believe, so statisticians believe uh, where you have a large residual is an implication of the presence of outlier. Another measure could be a standard, using a standardized residual. But we have uh, a new method, you know, that everybody knows uh, that we actually call a cook distance uh, method. And incidentally, um, this man is an emeritus professor of statistics known anywhere in the world. He's in the School of Statistics, University of Minnesota. So which is, she's, uh, is my colleague, uh, Professor Dennis Cook. So Dennis Cook actually, um, improve on the conventional way of invest of detecting outlier if, if you look at the the first one was residual residuals may have an issue may not be um may not cannot be trusted okay and there was an improvement on residual that we call the standardized residual right that in a way that may not also be trusted but if you take a look at all of that take a look at that Aru, here, how high, okay? And the ECAP residual, the cook, the Professor Dennis was able to, you know, uh, modify them in one equation, okay? Which is called DI, okay? And um, if you basically, the large cook distance means observation will be more influential, let me tell you, uh, when there's an outlier, okay? That, that doesn't mean it is not all outlier that could be damaging. You know, just like what I used to tell uh, my friend, when police pull you over, wait, obey the police. It is not all everybody that police pull over that get ticket at the end of the day. I have been pulled over before and I didn't get ticket. I know and a good number of people. So what we're trying to say is that how are we actually going to know whether an outlier could be damaging then we have to look at the case, a cook distance case that is greater than one. When a cook distance is greater than one. Okay, I'm going to give you an example now. Okay, I, I wanted to take a look at this guy here. You see that point? It's far away from others. Do you see the point, right? It's far away from others. That's merely, you know, looking at that picture now. Okay, we are suspecting that guy to be an outlier. But if we really want to know whether it's going to be damaging, then we need to compute cook distance. But what do we get for the cook distance 0 0.03? That, that, that is not uh, going to cause any problem because we got a threshold for cook distance. Okay, investigate the case with cook distance greater than one. I'm going to show you another one now. I'll give you another example now. Okay. Take a look at this uh, example right here. Okay. You got a particular point that is not aligned. And we compute the cook distance. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at that. The cook distance here is 4.7. Then this is basically going to be damaging. Okay, so you know we said we basically need to investigate that. That could cause a problem because the cook distance is basically greater than one. Okay, now what are the strategies for dealing with influential observations? You know, some of my colleagues will simply remove. Okay, but let me tell you, the only point that you can remove is when. It is through erroneous imputation. Maybe you make an error in recordings. You can actually discard that. 
But what if in a situation where it is a genuine observation, you cannot discard. If I, that was what I work on in my PhD work that I defended in 2016, okay, where I try to look at, um, you know, I work on the analysis of variance, you know, analysis of variance as uh, as options. And one of the assumptions is the absence of outlier. When outlier is present and I want to use ANOVA, what are we going to do without removing the outline data point? Of course, there have been conventional approach use. Some use non-parametric. Has anybody heard about non-parametric approach? Like a alternative to ANOVA that we call Cruz Kawalis. Has anybody heard about Cruz Ka? Cruz Kawalis. Has anybody heard about this? This is a non-parametric approach, alternative to one way analysis of variance. Situation where assumptions fail and they now come back and use this guy. But this guy is a non-parametric approach. In a non-parametric approach, it has, it involves ranking, ranking of observation. Even though this particular method yield a very good result, but there's a problem with the method because the observation, you know, it involves ranking. Okay, there's going to be lots of generalization, lots of generality, lots of generality because there's no originality. There's no originality in the data anymore because you are using the rank values instead of the original values. And of course, uh, what I did in my work is uh, to actually provide to modify FTS, introducing a shape parameter that will enable it to withstand that outlier, okay? Okay, now identify the cause, like before you can, be, before you can remove or fit a different module, in my own case, I fit a different module, but before you can remove or fit a different module, you need to ask a question about the cause. Is it due to erroneous imputation? Then you can remove. If it is not, then you fit a different module. And the module that I fitted, we call that robust module. Now, the reason could be that incompetent lab assistance and so on like that. Now, the second objective of the day is to walk you through coding. I deliberately provided our code here. I wanted to run that, like even before your lab session, can I have opportunity? Let's work on this uh, particular question now that has to do with the salary of professional workers, okay? And of course, we, are, we want to look at the effect of experience on salary. And, you know, after fitting the model, this is a simple linear regression model, okay? We're basically going to subject the model into diagnostic testing, like looking at the residual plots, looking at the QQ plots. Of course, you know, using the residual plots, you basically are going to, you can investigate whether there's a constant variance or whether uh, they say the, whether the linearity has option hold, of course. And the plot one in the regression diagnostics, I'm going to say that again, plot number one in regression diagnosis is residual plots. Why do we call it residual plot? You know, I told you the other time, when you are investigating, okay, as option, all what we're going to be doing, dealing with is going to be analysis of residual. Does that make sense? That's why you have a residual plot. Okay. So the residual plot, we do two jobs. We perform two jobs. One, identify linearity, whether you know it's basically going to identify whether there's a violation of linearity. And the second one, equal variance. And sometimes we use it to identify unusual observation like outlier or leverage or high leverage. Then another one, the plot number two in the regression diagnostics is normal QQ plot. What is the function of a normal QQ plot? The function of a normal QQ plot is just uh, to investigate whether error duly followed normal distribution. 
Now we want to investigate normality, absorption. And now why are you going to know using uh, these plots? I said these plots can be used to identify the violations of normality. The better the dots are drawn to a straight line, the less the violation of normality. You basically, you basically going to see a straight line, a diagonal straight line, which you are actually going to see. Then we also have plot number three. It's not necessary in this course. Then we have plot number four. You know, in plot number four, uh, the official name for that is what we call leverage. And this, the vertical axis of the plot is going to be called a standardized residual. And this is a plot that also do the job of cook distance. You know, you know, we said the other time, the, the dotted um, red line will label boundaries of the cook distance, which is gonna be between 0.5 and one. Okay. Now, the situation we are this, uh, you know, cook distance equal to one, we're gonna take a decision and so on like that. So I think I'm trying to discuss, you know, that now, you know, uh, you, you know, by the time you, you run the code, you're basically going to see the plot that I'm talking about, okay? Now, this is basically the arrow code for outliers, okay? And if you look at the third one, very, very crucial, that is the one for cook distance, cooks.distance, M-O-D. What is your M-O-D? Your M-O-D is your, you know, is this guy here, M-O-D equal to L-M salary on that okay so what have we discussed here what i'm just trying to say there are three plots even though there are four plots but three are very very useful the plot number one is a residual plot plot number two is a normal kq plot plot number three we don't really need it in this course but plot number four is the one that has to do with our uh, uh, coca you know, distance. And of course, I give you the code for the 13 now outlier. You know, this particular cook does distance with compute for every data point. You're going to have so many values, you know, for uh, for response number one, there's going to be a cook distance value for that. If I have 10 observation, I'm actually going to have a 10 cook distance values. I'm actually going to look at a particular cook distance value Let's say a particular code is a value is greater than one, then I will look at the corresponding response data point. That point may be we may be suspecting that to be an outlier. Okay, take a look at what I said. You know, in the case of outlier, it is not only cook distance. You know, I told you there is at values, there is arrow standard, and that's a standardized residual. You know, if you want to use standardized residual. We, we have a range, minus two to two, okay? When you compute, if, you know, and that's why I said an outlier is an observation who standardized residual fall outside, minus two to two. That is if I want to use, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, standardized, uh, but let me tell you this, there are some researchers that can actually, use minus three to three. Outlier in my feed may not be outlier in your feed. <laughs> Some can, uh, but to be at the server side, why not going for cook distance? An inflation point is an observation whose cook distance is greater than one. Any question? Now, what is gonna be next? Oh my God, do you know on Friday, I'm basically gonna tell you that what we did today could be misleading. <laughs> Diagnostic plots can be misleading, but I'm gonna identify, okay, conditions under which they could mislead. But let me tell you this, what I, what I actually show today, they are, you know, the diagnostic uh, is like using the idea of diagnostic plots in, you know, in a regression diagnostics. Okay, it is not only diagnostic plot that we can use. We have standards tests too. 
Does that make sense? And that is the reason why the one for, uh, I'm going to quickly walk you back to the that of the normality now. Let's say, for instance, I plot, I, I got a normal QQ plot, and it's very confusing. Or maybe I identify a situation where it could be misleading. Then what is going to replace that? If I if I don't want to use plot, I can use Shapiro wiki test of normality. We have several tests of normality around. We have a Komogoro Siminov test. We have a Dancy test. We have a Shapiro wiki test. Let me tell you, whenever there's a problem, we always, we're always going to have a way out. There are a lot of options available to us in statistics. Any question? Because what I'm going to walk you through on Friday is to walk you through situations where diagnostic plot can be misleading. Let me tell you, it's just like identify situations where judges, <laughs> you know, judges, those who decide case in the court of law, they can be misleading. Don't you know that? At times, and that is the reason why when a case is being litigated, I've seen situations whereby somebody appeal. Maybe they say, okay, uh, this guy is guilty in this court. And this guy say, no. And this guy is going to appeal. To what? To the upper court. Maybe to the court of appeal. Do you know there's possibility that this guy actually win here? So what we are seeing as judges here that we call the diagnostic plot they also have their own limitations. They have their own assumption too. So what we're going to do next time is to be able to identify situation under which we may not be able to trust our diagnostic test. You don't want a situation where there's going to be false positive. How many more time do I have? How many? 12 more. Oh, I got a lot of time. Okay. So any question? Uh, before I go today, uh, I'm basically going to say this. For those who are not satisfied with a midterm one result, 